We've been talking about white privilege. I'd like to talk about male privilege. Um, there's uh, an interesting article uh, by Guy Sorman in the uh, French newspaper Le Monde that was forwarded along to me uh, by a listener and uh, translated by his wife, Raquel. And I don't, I don't know if they want their last name used on the air, so I won't. But um, I also did a Google translation uh, looked up the article and did a Google translation on it, and it's a pretty clean translation. And and I think Guy gets started in the right place. I would like to take it a step beyond where he's going with it, but let me just share with you what, what uh, Guy Sorman uh, wrote in Le Mans about, uh, he said, uh, the, the headline is, the, the, the main common thread among, among radical Muslim movements is women. And he asked the question, what is the link among Muslim movements as different as Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, the Taliban, and ISIS? What do these groups have in common? He says, all claim to be based on the Quran, but actually they have different interpretations, which is correct. They, 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 and, and, and in fact, some of them are, are Shia, some are Sunni, Sunni some are, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, he says they're all embedded in different cultures. Correct. So what is it that's in common among them? He says, however, there's a link that unites them, which has less to do with religion or ideology and more of what one can call group psychoanalysis, hatred of women, misogyny. Now, I would add to this, see, he's looking at the Muslim movements, the fundamentalist Muslims. I would add to this the fundamentalist Christians. You've got fundamentalist Christians who want to uh, restrict a woman's right to choose to have an abortion, who want to, to uh, uh, who are fighting against equal pay laws for women, who basically are asserting that women should be silent, uh, that it's that they should be, you know, forced motherhood, forced pregnancy. So I, I would say this is not just radical Islam, it's radical religion. He says, we do, we, we do not find the source of this hatred of women and their bodies in the Koran. The Prophet Muhammad did not treat women with violence nor with contempt. And his spouse, Khadijah, was at his side and took part in his conquests and his revelations. Something I did not know. Uh, Guy Sorman goes on to say, it is true that in the West, there's always been discrimination against women, less in recent times, but they were not exterminated as they are today in Allah's name, as in Nigeria and Mount Sinjar in Iraq. We may read and reread the Quran, but we will not find the source of this hatred in it. And then he gets into Saeed Qutb. Saeed Qutb uh, died in 1966 at the hands of uh, Nasser, as I recall. Yeah, in fact, President uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser pushed uh, Islamists toward violence. Kitab, uh, there's uh, Adam Curtis, the British documentary filmmaker, makes films for BBC, uh, put together a video, and I think this one is called The Power of Nightmares. There's, there's a couple of them that he did that that are just absolutely extraordinary, but... He did, he did one, and you can find it on YouTube and, and in other places around the Internet, uh, this, this, this uh, three-hour series, as I recall, documentary, about uh, the origin of the Muslim Brotherhood and, and at the same time the origin of the neoconservative movement in the United States and how this guy, uh, uh, Kitab, Saeed Kitab, Kitab, Q U T B Kitab um, came to the United States. He was in New York in, in 1949, and then he moved to uh, St. Louis, as I recall, and got his degree, and then went back to Egypt. And he was horrified by what he saw here in the United States. He apparently had a bad romantic encounter in New York and decided women are awful. And then he went to St. Louis and he saw, you know, middle class households and green lawns. I mean, he actually went on a tirade about lawns you know, wasted space and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, but basically, it was the decadence of the West that horrified him. And he went back to Egypt and, and founded the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. And a lot of these groups came out of this. But the point is that most of these hyper-fundamentalist groups are not just about their religion, and in some cases, kill the infidel or, you know, kill those who won't convert and all that kind of thing. They're not just about their religion. They are also about oppressing women. And to the extent that the Judeo-Christian ethic has informed the United States and the creation of the United States and the laws of the United States over all these years, I would submit to you that that has, in, in some very, very significant ways, influenced uh, influenced the, the, the state of affairs, as it were, with regard to women in the United States and women around the world. There's a piece that I had. I don't think I closed it. Maybe I did. Well, it was, there was a really interesting article titled The Things That Women Can't, Couldn't Do in the 1960s. And I thought I had this up on my screen, and I don't. But, you know, the women, the, the women in the United States were lacking rights. It, it, in, in many cases, well, I'll, I'll have to find it during the break and, and, and bring it back to you. But, you know, I, I wrote about this in actually in unequal protection about the situation with women in the United States up until fairly recently. This is, see, this is something that is like ancient male privilege, as it were. And women, hang on just a second here, here we go, 51 to 53. Got to look at my own book. At the time of the formation of the United States, and for the next basically 150 years, a married woman was not allowed to make out a will, because I'm quoting myself here, this is my book, Unequal Protection, which you can find for free online over at uh, truthout.org, and of course from any bookstore. Um, a married woman was not legally allowed to make out a will because she could, was not legally allowed to own land or control anything else worthy of willing to another person. Any property a woman brought into the marriage became her husband's at the moment of marriage and would revert to her only if he died and she did not remarry. But even then, she would get only one-third of her husband's property, and what third that was and how she could use it were determined by a male court-appointed executor who would supervise her for the rest of her life or until she remarried, in which case she was handed off to another male. When a widow died, the, ex the, the executor would either take the property for himself or decide to whom it could pass. A woman had no say in the matter because she had no right to sign a will, a will. She could not sue in a court of law except under the same weak procedures allowed for the mentally ill and children supervised by men. If the man of a family household died, the executor would decide who would raise the wife's children and in what religion. She had no right to make those decisions. If she was poor, it was a virtual certainty that her children would be taken from her. It was impossible in the United States of America for a married woman to have any legal responsibility for her children, control of her own property, buy or sell land, or even obtain an ordinary license. So we have white privilege, and then we have male privilege, and then we have white male privilege, and you add it all together and it's really ugly. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And in other cultures, it's it's male privilege of whoever is the ruling group, in many cases not white, as in the case of Boko Haram. Uh, 